My name is John Goldsmith, and this is the third of 10 videos that I'm going to be making about a book that I published in 2019 called Battle in the Minefields. Battle in the Minefields is a book I published uh, along with a friend and colleague from the University of Paris, Bernard Axe. We cover a lot of territory between around 1820 and 1938 in the book. And in this third chapter, we talk about the philosophical background for the 19th century that we need to know and that we need to have um, some understanding of in order to understand what was going on really in linguistics and the other mind sciences during the 20th century. Now, we basically decided to uh, look, not look at people before 1800, but when we turned to philosophy, this just wasn't possible. Because to understand 19th century philosophy, you really have to begin with Immanuel Kant. Um, Kant is spelled K-A-N-T. Um, Kant's goal was to find a synthesis of two earlier traditions that came before him, what we call empiricism uh, and rationalism. If you take a course today in modern philosophy, basically you look at the uh, empiricists and the rationalists leading up to, to Kant. Um, and among the empiricists, the most important were David Hume and John Locke. Um, and among the rationalists, um, René Descartes and Gottfried Leibniz. And Kant was looking for a way to synthesize the uh, two positions. The empiricist position was all knowledge comes through the senses. That was one of the most important principles. The rationalist pers uh, perspective was, yes, all knowledge comes through the senses, except the knowledge which is already in the mind. So the question is, what was the knowledge that was already in the mind? When we look at um, Descartes and Leibniz, we see examples well like the following. For Descartes, the prime example of an innate idea, something that could not have been learned through the senses, or the concept of a triangle. For Leibniz, it was something uh, more abstract. It was, for example, an enthymeme, that's an old traditional Greek term for an argument that's valid only once we make explicit um, a, a major premise. So that for Leibniz, there was, there was reasoning that was going on by the human mind, but it was employing, it had access to general principles that it didn't always bring out. So the, the, one of the goals of philosophy was to bring out what these, these hidden assumptions are. That's a very modern thought, much more modern than Descartes. On the empiricist side was, uh, as I mentioned, Locke and, and David Hume. It is one of the principles in our book that it's important to get to know philosophers and psychologists and linguists from the past, that we can actually enter into a kind of a communication with them, a conversation. So let's uh, let's take a look. It's gotten much better that we listen to him than that we listen to me trying to channel him. Kant wrote at the very beginning of the first critique, a critique of pure reason. He wrote, "There can be no doubt that all our knowledge begins with experience. For how should our faculty of knowledge be awakened into action? Um, did not objects affecting our senses partly of themselves produce representations? Partly arouse the activity of our understanding." to compare these representations, and by combining or separating them, work up the raw material of the sensible impressions into that knowledge of objects which is entitled experience. In the order of time, therefore, we have no knowledge antecedent to experience, and with experience all our knowledge begins. So, those are, that's Locke and Hume, he's saying, yeah, on the face of it, sounds right, but, and he goes on, but though, our, but though our knowledge begins with experience, it does not follow that it all arises out of experience. For it may well be that even our empirical knowledge is made up of what we receive through impressions and of what our own faculty of knowledge, sensible impressions serving merely as the occasion, supplies from itself. If our faculty of knowledge makes any such addition, it may be that we are not in a, in a position to distinguish it from the raw material until with long practice of attention we have become skilled in separating it. So, maybe human luck weren't right. This then is the question which at least calls for closer examination and does not allow of any offhand answer whether there is any knowledge that is thus independent of experience and even of all impressions of the senses. So that's what he's going to look for. 
a little bit later he writes, in what follows therefore we shall understand by a priori knowledge, not knowledge independent of this or that experience, but knowledge absolutely independent of all experience. Opposed to it is empirical knowledge, which is knowledge um, possible only a posteriori, that is, through experience. A priori modes of knowledge are entitled pure when there's no admixture of anything empirical, and thus, for instance, the proposition, every alteration has a cause, we'll come back to that, while an a priori proposition is not a pure proposition, because alteration is a concept which can be derived only from experience. Okay, so he's going to be looking at concepts. Kant is going to be looking at concepts and trying to determine what experience, if any, do these concepts arise out of. And he will find over and over again that the most basic and the most interesting concepts that we have that make our, our thought possible do not arise out of experience. And Kant continues. Now it is easy to show that there actually are in human knowledge judgments which are necessary and in the strictest sense universal, and which are therefore pure a priori judgments. If an example from the science is be desired, we have only to look to any of the propositions of mathematics. Uh, that is controversial or would turn out to be controversial, but we note it and continue. If we seek an example from the understanding in its quite ordinary employment, the proposition every alteration must have a cause will serve our purpose. So alteration here does not mean making your pants shorter. It means essentially a change. In the latter case, indeed, the very concept of a cause so manifestly contains the concept of a necessity of connection with an effect of the strict universality of the rule that the concept would be altogether lost if we attempted to derive it, as Hume has done, from a repeated association of that which happens with that which proceeds, and from a custom of connecting representations, a custom originating in this repeated association and constituting, therefore, a merely subjective necessity. So what Kant is saying is that from a perceived alteration or an understood alteration, an event, an occurrence, some change, there is a, necess a necessary connection in our mind to a cause which then has a strong connection to the action or alteration that we notice. That's what he's saying. He does engage with in conversations with Locke and Hume. The illustrious Locke, failing to take account of these considerations and meeting with pure concepts of the understanding and experience, deduced them also from experience and yet proceeded so inconsequently that he attempted with their aid to obtain knowledge which far transcends all limits of experience. And he goes on, he talks about David Hume likewise. In the end, what he's interested in, as I say, are these concepts, and I'll just say a little bit about them. This is going to come back when we talk about logic and Husserl in several chapters from now in 20th century philosophy. So, categories for Kant. It can, be easily, uh, it can easily be carried out with the aid of the ontological manuals, for instance, by placing under the category of causality the predicables of force, action, and passion I, I, let me say something about this. So he wants to understand causality better. And what he's saying is that inherent in any notion of cause will be force, action, and passion. Passion here it, it is not like, oh, I, I love or I hate something. Passion is the opposite of acting. You've got one thing acting on another. There's an actor, there's an action produced by the actor, and then the passion is... It, we see the root, same root in, in passive. It's that which undergoes the action. Back to Kant. Under the category of community, the predicables of presence and resistance, so these are two objects which are um, interacting with one another as, as co-equals. Under the predicaments of modality, the predicables of coming to be, ceasing to be, change, etc. So here, time comes into the picture. Moving on. In this treatise, I purposely omit the definitions of categories, although I may be in possession of them. This is very strange. He's saying he's got more here, but he wants to write an abstract book, so he's not going to go into everything he knows. I shall proceed to analyze these concepts only so far as necessary in connection with the doctrine 
of method which I am propounding. In a system of pure reason, definitions of the categories would rightly be demanded, but in this treatise they would merely divert attention from the main object of the inquiry, arousing doubts and objections, which, without detriment to what is essential to our purposes, can very well be reserved for another occasion. Yeah, you know, in my opinion, it would have been really helpful if he'd gone into examples, but he has already explained in the in the introduction that he doesn't believe in examples. You can work it out for yourself. So here's an example of a, a table of the concepts and the categories that um, he will explain. And they come in triples. So just take an example of the first, unity, plurality, and, and totality. These do not come from experience. These are concepts that make these are categories that make experience possible. A unity is whatever the mind makes it to be. And plurality is a relationship between two or more unities as created by the mind. And finally, totality is something in addition to any particular number of them. You see seven stars, you say these form a group. But then you say in addition, and that's all there is in, in this set. That's totality. The, none of these concepts can be reduced to the other, although plurality and totality uh, clearly depend on unity, just as totality uh, rests on plurality. Okay, so that's, that's Kant's goal, to create a logic or a super logic which explains the relationship among these categories that are necessary for thought to be possible. Well, enough about Kant for now. I've actually talked more in this video about Kant than, than we do in the book and addressed slightly different questions from what we discuss in the book. But I hope that this discussion illustrates for you the way in which we try to engage in a conversation with the philosophers, psychologists, the linguists in the past and treat them in a sense as our colleagues today. I'll mention one other point, um, and that is, if you think about it, the concepts that Kant wants to analyze, we've just looked at a, a little bit of it, they're all concepts that matter deeply to linguists. You know, I made that comment about active and passive, but the same is true, well, causality as well. The concepts that Kant wants to analyze and argues that do, do not arise directly out of experience but proceed and make experience possible, those concepts are the ones that we linguists employ when we analyze the morphology and the syntax of languages today. I wish that were a more central observation in the way we do linguistics. It's not. This will come back just a little bit when we return to when we turn to Edmund Husserl a couple chapters from now. We're going to move on now from Kant. I'm going to talk primarily, I'm going to focus on three philosophers in the 19th century who were very important, and yet they're not talked about very much today. So let me mention them. Um, the first was Auguste Comte, C-O-M-T-E, is a French philosopher who basically created what we know of as positivism. The second um, is Ernst Mach, M-A-C-H, Ernst Mach, um, who developed a newer, more scientific concept of, of um, positivism. And the third is Franz Brentano, who, well, you'll see what was so important about him. Um, to put it in a word, he had many ideas that were then developed by students of his, which have now become very uh, common and well known to us. So we need to understand where these ideas came from and how they were rooted. Auguste Comte was a French philosopher. He wasn't an academic. He wrote with, seems to me, a, a lively, very readable style. I encourage you to read him. It's much easier to read than Kant is. If you read him, I think you can see the effect of a British empiricist like David Hume. I think you can see the impact of Immanuel Kant as well. Um, but he had his own point of view. Um, one of the things that you, you take away when you read uh, Kant is he writes in a way that makes it seem like he understands everything and it's really very simple, and he's just going to explain it to you. There's this great feeling of, of, of self-confidence in a way we don't really see in Hume and we don't see in Kant. They're, they're kind of walking around subjects trying to draw a conclusion and, and, and trying to explain to you why you should believe them. With Kant, no, it's, it's not that. It's, he really he understands everything already, and he's just, just going to explain it to you. 
One of the ideas that's most central to Kant's thought is an idea about a development of, uh, it's, it's a notion of the evolution or the development, the growth of, of knowledge and thought. And in this way, he's very different from Hume and from Kant, and he very much represents the 19th century, which is a century of history, as I mentioned in the previous video, or previous chapter. Uh, so this idea that Kant is very excited about is the idea that human thought um, follows three stages. The first stage he calls a theological, and that's the stage in which our understanding of the world is, you might say, mediated through concepts about God and gods. We think that the explanation for what's going on in the world is that gods are actors, gods are doing things, they are the the decisions and the actions taken by God are the reasons why things happen, things, why things are the way they are in, in this world. The second stage he calls a metaphysical stage, and this is one where we get rid of the gods as people, but we continue to believe that there are forces behind the scenes that we can't see that are responsible for the way the world is. Then the third stage he calls scientific or positive, and that's where the term positivism comes from. And in this stage, we get rid of our belief in things behind the scenes. What there is, is just what there is. There isn't more that we can't see. And although uh, Comte thought he was extremely pro-science, and he, he certainly was, what we could call scientism, people, I mean, that's the term that's used, this scientism, this sense that science is the by far the most reliable way to come to an understanding of the world. For Comte, science meant getting rid of our beliefs, our metaphysical beliefs, in hidden forces behind the scenes. Now, unfortunately, Kant said a lot of things about science that ended up being wildly wrong and that scientists completely disagree with, um, and they disagreed with over the course of the decades of the 19th century. He So Kant didn't believe in atoms. They were too small to be seen and uh, he didn't believe there were there were there were all sorts of hidden things you couldn't see them and for him that meant they weren't there but this is an important part of many movements in philosophy psychology linguistics this sense of it's our job to clear out the stables the augean stables if we if we allow ourselves a reference to greek mythology and Hercules had to clean out the Augean stables. Well, that's what Kant wanted to do too. He wanted, as we pass into the third stage of our knowledge and move into a, a generation of, of real science, he wanted to clear out all of the ideas that were left behind that were really the remnants of beliefs in gods that came from that first theological stage. This is very central to everything that Kant said, and it was one of the reasons that his writing was so popular. Kant had some very interesting things to say about the development of scientific thought. As I, I, I said uh, just a minute ago, um, Kant was one of the first people to bring history into, under, the, into our understanding of what science is. Um, John Stuart Mill wrote the following about Kant. He, he wrote, the philosophy of science consists of two principal parts the methods of investigation, and the requisites of proof. The one points out the roads by which the human intellect arrives at conclusions, the other the mode of testing their evidence. The former, if complete, would be an organon of discovery, the latter of proof. It's to the first of these that Monsieur Comte uh, principally confines himself, and he treats it with a degree of perfection hitherto unrivaled. We are taught the right way of searching for results, but when a result has been reached, how shall we know that it is true? And that's the second part. Well, some of the things that Kant said would be reset a hundred years later without any reference to Kant. Um, let me write to you. Uh, let me read to you what uh, Kant wrote about about this. All science can be presented in two essentially distinct ways, and any other manner of, of exposition can only be some sort of combination of the two, a historical approach and a dogmatic approach. Now, dogmatic here doesn't mean stubborn. You'll see what it means in a moment. With the former, the historical approach, we present knowledge in stages in the same order that the human mind actually encountered them. 
in adopting as much as possible the same paths to arrive there. With the latter, we present a system of ideas as it could be understood today by a single mind, which from an appropriate intellectual position and with sufficient knowledge could rebuild all of science. The human mind constantly tends to substitute the second, the dogmatic order, for the first, the historic order. The dogmatic order is the only one that satisfies the final state of our intelligence. A hundred years from now, in the context, uh, from then, in the context of the Vienna Circle and uh, Rudolf Carnap and Hans Reichenbach, this um, second, what Comte calls the dogmatic approach, would be would be called the rational reconstruction of science, and it becomes a very important idea in the uh, in in the context of of the Vienna Circle, and we'll come back to this. Um, so, as you can see, dog, dogmatic approach doesn't mean stubborn, and it doesn't really mean dogma, except insofar as dogma refers to what the, the contemporary conclusions are in science. So, if we read Kant further, he will make some strong arguments that to people, for people who are going to become scientists, it's important to teach both in the dogmatic way, that is to say the content of the theories as rationally reconstructed, and also in the historical approach. And the work that Lax and I are doing in this book tries to do th that as well. We didn't, we didn't draw this immediately from Kant, but we're certainly operating uh, along similar lines. And um, again, 100 years from now, in the context of the Vienna Circle, people would later talk about what came to be known as the genetic fallacy, which is to say, Roughly, the genetic fallacy was uh, trying to draw conclusions about the validity of a scientific hypothesis on the basis of how the idea was developed. And um, uh, Comte, um, although he didn't have the genetic fallacy to talk about, he believed that the, the logic of how we get to ideas was an extremely important part of science. The name of Ernst Mach is not remembered very much anymore, and more's the pity. He was a very influential scientist at the end of the 19th century and uh, a thinker about science, philosopher of science. Uh, he was born in 1838 in Moravia, which was part of Austria. It's now part of the Czech Republic. And um, he was a professor first at Graz in Austria um, and then in Prague. And in 1895, he was offered a position um, at the University of Vienna, which he accepted. Um, but unfortunately, just a few years later, he had a stroke, which uh, really ended his, his academic career. And his chair was um, actually taken by Ludwig Boltzmann after that. Mach was very interested in, in education and came back to this question that I talked about a minute ago in the context of, um, of what Comte had to say about how to teach science and the, and the relationship between what um, Comte referred to as the historical as opposed to the dogmatic approach. Um, Mach wrote this, the historical study of the evolution of a science is absolutely necessary, for without it the laws which it has acquired through its arduous labor may well turn into a system of half-understood precepts, or worse, a system of preconceived ideas. The historical approach not only helps us to understand what our present understanding is, it also opens up in us new possibilities of showing us that what exists is to a large extent conventional and fortuitous. By taking a historical perspective in which different conceptual avenues converge, we can also see ourselves better and see paths as yet undiscovered. I think that's incredibly important. I'll add another reason for studying the history of a science. That is, you see how it is that steps forward are made, and that's absolutely crucial because nobody else is gonna show you. In some respects, Mach was following in the footsteps of a philosopher like David Hume or Auguste, Auguste Comte. But unlike Hume and Comte, um, Mach was himself a scientist, and that had a, a, a real influence on how he thought about knowledge as it was created by, by science. And he took what was often called an anti-metaphysical approach. And in the, in the particular case, one of the cases that he was very interested in was the uh, our understanding of space and time. And his anti-metaphysical position on this um, led him to, to demand of himself and others uh, a 
deeper understanding of what it means to speak of the size of something, what it means to speak of measurement of, of spatial considerations, length, width, depth, or or time related chronological observations. What does it, what does it mean to say that one event occurred two seconds after another? So Mach went back to Newton, essentially, and said, I don't believe that space and time exist independently of of us and of the things that we're measuring. Let's let's get down to brass tacks. What does it really mean to say that something moved from position A to position B? We can't identify position A or B in any uh, abstract, absolute sense. We, By that position, the only way we can add some meaning to talking about a position is to say what the position is with respect to other things. Well, what does that mean exactly? Which things is it that we need to compare it to? And if everything is compared to everything else, how do we get out of this Alice in Wonderland situation? So he basically called on physicists to rethink the basic concepts of of space and time. And 40 years later, um, it was Einstein who took the questions that Mach asked and very famously uh, came up with a, a quite new understanding of the relationship of space and time. And Einstein very famously said it was it was Mach's asking of these questions that allowed him to turn around and formulate new answers about what the nature of space and time is. So the core sensibility of the positivists in the 19th century was basically a skepticism about what was often referred to as metaphysical concepts. And what, what I just described uh, about Mach's interest in space and time is a, a perfect exa example of this. So the positivist says, yes, I can measure things. Absolutely, I can do that. And maybe that's all I can do. And maybe the other grand ideas that people before us have been talking about, they're grand, but you know, in, in, in fact, they're just fuzzy ways of, um, of talking about the things that we can actually measure. So the, the positivist view in the 19th century was very much a let's clear out the stables view. Um, that we'll keep measurement because we all agree we can do it, but let's be skeptical about everything else. Um, this led Mach early on to, to talk about relationships between things that can be observed, things that can be perceived, things that can be measured. And you know, take, for example, a, a melody. Um, if we think of a melody as a sequence of notes, we recognize that it's not just a sequence of notes the same we can have the same melody which could be raised or lowered by the same number but we raise or lower all of the notes by the same number of of steps it's the same melody so there has to be uh, more than just saying experience it's just a whole lot of individual experiences there's an organization to experiences and in 1865 um, uh, and Mach wrote a paper in which he described, he, he talked about his understanding of this gestalt. So the gestalt or form was that which is in addition to the individual details that can be specified about an experience, how they all fit together. And this notion of a gestalt would be taken up again, um, as we'll see in a few minutes. And plays, of course, leads into the creation of gestalt psychology um, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. I'm going to talk just lightly about Brentano. Um, I did publish an article recently on a webpage, Aeon, A-E-O-N, about Brentano, um, especially the relationship between Brentano and his students. If you, if you Google on Brentano Goldsmith, that'll be the first article that comes up. Well, Brentano was a very interesting person um, at the, towards the end of the 19th century. Basically, there were two leading figures in this joint field called philosophy psychology. Wundt was one, Wilhelm Wundt, who we'll turn to next week, um, and the other was Franz Brentano. These were two people whose careers and whose intellectual commitments were equally to philosophy and psychology. We tend to remember Wundt today as a psychologist and less as a philosopher. We tend to remember Brentano today when we do more as a philosopher and less as a psychologist. But at the time, they were both viewed as doing both, and they certainly themselves viewed themselves as doing both. If we look at this map here, this genealogical map that I've drawn of Brentano, 
you see that he had great influence on a large number of important people. Some of these names you'll know and some I, I hope that I can introduce you to. Of course, you can see Sigmund Freud was a student of his and we all know Sigmund Freud. I'm not sure how many of these other names are well known. For our purposes, the most important is Edmund Husserl and we'll be talking about his. He's a philosopher who originally got his PhD in mathematics. Um, but his his work at the beginning of the 20th century would be very important for the mind sciences. Let's look at some of, the, uh, some of these other people. Anton Marti is an uh, Im important person in the philosophy of language. Tomasz Mazurik was the first uh, president of, um, of Czechoslovakia after the um, the Versailles peace negotiations after World War I. Um, he became president of uh, of, the, of Czechoslovakia, and we'll come back to him in a historical context. He was also extremely supportive of the Prague Linguistic Circle um, and was the teacher of Wilhelm Matesius, who was the faculty advisor to the Prague Linguistic Circle. Um, Alexis Meinong is also an, an important person in the history of the philosophy of language. Twardowski was a, a Polish uh, philosopher whose work eventually um, uh, led to categorial grammar. Edmund Husserl's work, his ideas were were brought to bear in the creation of categorical grammar. If you're not familiar with categorical grammar, it was the really the first formal theory of language developed in, in Western Europe. Um, and Karl Stumpf was a, um, a laboratory psychologist, very important one and influential one, whose work led to much of what we think is standard basic understanding of, um, of uh, phonetics, and his work uh, was often cited by um, by Jacobson. All right, um, I'm going to leave that there so that we can talk about, about a couple other people in the few minutes that we've got left. The last section of uh, chapter three is devoted to the rise of symbolic logic in the second half of the 19th century, and we look in particular at three people. Um, we look at George Boole, we look at Gottlob Frege, and Bertrand Russell. Uh, George Boole was an Englishman who published in 1854 a very important book called The Laws of Thought. And in this book, he tries to develop a symbolic logic that would be able to deal with uh, logic and inference and probability. And he addresses questions about the relationship between the kind of thought that's being analyzed by his system on the one hand and language on the other. So nothing could be more important for our purposes. And Bull's book had a lasting imp impact on everybody uh, who followed him. Let's look at some of the things he said. As I said before, better to hear what Bull has to say than for me to try to channel him. He starts the book thus. The design of the following treatise is to investigate the fundamental laws of these operations of the mind by which reasoning is performed, to give expression to them in the symbolical language of a calculus, and upon this foundation to establish the science of logic and construct its method. To make that method itself the basis of a general method of the, for the application of the mathematical doctrine of probabilities, and finally, to collect from the various elements of truth brought to view in the course of these inquiries, some probable intimations concerning the nature and constitution of the human mind. Well, I didn't say it, but, you know, some of this is redolent of, of Leibniz as well. He goes on to acknowledge the importance of the development of probability to the study of, um, of gambling on the one hand and insurance on the other. In chapter two, Bu goes on to address the question, what's the relationship between language on the one hand and logic on the other? Because it's really quite clear that, that there's a connection. And how can we draw the line between the two? So the chapter is entitled of Signs in General and of the Signs Appropriate to the Science of Logic in particular, also of the laws to which that class of signs are subject. Um, I mentioned that Bull's work would have an impact on everybody that followed, and clearly he, his work, this, this book, had a big influence on Charles Sanders Peirce, who is at the origin of most of our thinking today about a theory of signs. The chapter begins. That, lang that language is an instrument of human reason and not merely a medium for the expression of thought is a truth generally admitted. It's proposed in this chapter to inquire what it is that renders language thus subservient to the most important of our intellectual faculties, which is to say logic. 
In the various steps of this inquiry, we shall be led to consider the constitution of language, considered as a system adapted to an end or purpose, to investigate its elements, to seek to determine the mutual relation and dependence, and to inquire in what manner they contribute to the attainment of the end to which, as coordinate parts of a system, they have respect. For though in investigating the laws of signs, a posteriori, after the fact, that is, the immediate subject of, ex of examination is language with the rules which govern its use. While in making the internal process of thought the direct object of inquiry, we appeal in a more immediate way to our personal consciousness, it will be found that in both cases the results obtained are formally equivalent. Nor could we easily conceive that the unnumbered tongues and dialects of the earth should have preserved through a long succession of ages so much that is common and universal were we not assured of the existence of some deep foundations of their agreement in the laws of the mind itself. And remember, this is 1854, so this is quite a while. It's five years before Darwin's book is published. Linguists have been studying the evolution of languages, the languages in Europe for the last 50 years, but this is remarkably prescient. The elements of which all language consists are signs or symbols. Words are signs. Sometimes they're said to represent things, sometimes the operations by which the mind combines together the simple notions of things to complex conceptions. Sometimes they express the relations of action, passion, or you remember passion, the opposite of action. Action, passion, or mere quality, which we perceive to exist among the objects of our experience, sometimes the emotions of the perceiving mind. Though the tendency of prose writing is towards uniformity, yet even there the order of sequence of adjectives absolute in their meaning and applied to the same subject is indifferent, in the sense that it doesn't matter what the order is. But poetic diction borrows much of its rich diversity from the extension of the same lawful freedom to the substantive also. The language of Milton is peculiarly distinguished by this species of, species of variety. Not only does the substantive often precede the adjectives by which it is qualified, but it is frequently placed in their midst. In the first few lines of the invocation to light, we meet with such examples as the following. Offspring of heaven firstborn, as opposed to firstborn heaven. The rising world of waters dark and deep. Bright effluence of bright essence in create, and so forth. So here's a philosopher who's starting to do linguistics. Not very good linguistics, but linguistics nonetheless. Well, I spend too much time talking about George Bull, certainly more than the, the time that we allocate to, it, allocate to his thought in chapter three. But I think you can see the reason that I did it is I want to give you a sense that, you know, you really can go back to the original. And it's much better for you to read the original than to hear somebody else's uh, re restatement of it. Frege is the next person that we want to take a look at, and Frege is, is very important in the history of philosophy. In many ways, he's the person who created analytic philosophy as we know it today, uh, and it's, a, in the eyes of many, the dominant philosophical tradition through most of the 20th century. Um, and in Frege, we find uh, princi principal messages. First of all, that the principal problems of philosophy can be investigated through thought. Thought is not the same thing as thinking, and the way to investigate thought is through language. And those three principles lay a, a very clear direction for many philosophers to go in over the course of the 20th century. And through those principles, Frege had a, a big impact on how we think both about thought and about language. Well, I've reached my self-imposed limit of um, how much I'm going to cover in this video. So I'm going to call it a day, call it a week. If you want to read more, um, there's more material in Chapter 3 that I haven't begun to touch on. And as for Bertrand Russell, yes, he deserves to be here, but he's going to come back in a later chapter when we talk about the Vienna Circle. So I'll leave Bertrand Russell for then. Um, Bernard Lacks and I just got the cover back for the French version of this book. There you can see it. Aux origines des sciences humaines, linguistique, philosophie, logique, psychologie, 1840 jusqu'à 1940, and to be published by Gallimard. And so we're very happy about this. And probably around September of 2021, they'll be able to read this book in French. See you next week.